Welcome back, honors. All right, so let's go ahead and try and get straight into this. Not a lot of gimmicks in this guy today, not a lot of stuff, but then again, we're also going to try and move quickly so we don't take up too, too much of your time. Uh, I know it's crazy the next couple days going on, but just to give you a heads up, uh, your study guide for this unit will be posted relatively soon. And then also, not to mention the fact that it's looking like your first virtual school open note test is going to be, I mean, to open notes, not to testing. You know how I feel about testing. It's like this, you know, but you know how y'all feel about open notes. It's like this, and I feel like about open notes. So getting into it, though, we left off talking about the uh, rumblings of revolution in Haiti. Now, a lot of us don't like to call uh, colonial independence movements as revolutions. A lot of historians don't like that terminology. Mm. Due to the fact that a revolution is the systematic overthrow of a government by a group of people existing inside of a country already. An established government, an established country overthrowing its government and then, you know, rising up, changing it, that's a revolution. Whereas an independence movement is what we're going to see much more of in Latin America. Now, Latin American independence movements are mainly called as such because you've got a lot of disenfranchised people, like slaves coming out of Saint Domingue, going to be eventually Haiti, and also uh, the Creoles coming out of not Creole like Creole seasoning, not Tony Satry's kind of stuff, but Creoles as in the groups of native-born Latin Americans in areas of Latin America, which we'll get into next. But in 1789, the French Revolution blows up. Okay, this is going to inspire independence movements in Haiti as well, or Saint Domingue on the island of. Good job, Ellie. Hispaniola. All right, so let's go ahead and get into it. But this man right here is the one that ends up taking over the slave revolt in Haiti and leads them in the right direction of becoming their own independent country. His name is Toussaint Leverture, right? Toussaint Leverture. Now, Toussaint Leverture was a former slave himself. He was self-educated in a lot of ways. When I say self-educated, he actually had access to uh, a wealthy family. I believe it was one of his relatives because he was one of the former slaves that was probably of a little bit of mixed descent, um, would have fallen into the class of mulatto in uh, the Latin American colonies. But then he is going to be one of the products of that early slave revolt stuff. His family was allowed to own slaves, own property, and to vote because they were a little bit more established. So he ends up getting a very solid education, uh, very like self-educated through his own family members, and he ends up rising up. Now, he's untrained in the military and political matters, but he becomes a skilled general and a diplomat. He actually starts out working in one of the earlier slave revolts as a doctor, as a field doctor, and he sees the terrible disorganization of the Haitian troops um, or of the slave revolt troops, and he then gets them organized, and he trains them in both guerrilla warfare tactics, which we know is random, like, ah, like that, right? And then also as in skilled Napoleonic tactics, which are the formal military schemes of the day. Now, he takes the leadership of a slave revolt that breaks out in 1791, and that was a group of 100,000 slaves revolted. 100,000 slaves are going to revolt during his revolt. And he takes control of that, and he organizes them and gets them going in the right direction. And he eventually was so successful that even the Spanish commissioned him as an offer, as an officer, and the National Assembly is going to outlaw slavery. Now, some of you are like, why would the Spanish commission him as an officer? Well, remember, St. Domingue shares that island with the modern-day Dominican Republic, right? Santo Domingo, which is on the other side of the island. And as he was taking over large chunks of the island and ousting a lot of those uh, Grand Blancs and Petit Blancs, right? Like getting rid of a lot of the white troops and white settlers that were there. The Spanish commissioned him as an officer and he basically takes over Haiti and rules it almost as its de facto dictator in 1793. The National Assembly outlaws slavery in total and tells... Toussaint, like, look, stay within the French Empire. You're not an independent country. Uh, agree with us, but we'll give you a large amount of control. And he's like, all right, fine, I'll do that, right? So from 1793 up until about 1804, he's in charge of Haiti, right? He's in charge of Haiti, this newly established land where there are no slaves, technically. There was still some forced labor, uh, like some stuff like that going on. 
But Toussaint L'Ouverture leads a successful revolutionary movement and or an independence movement, and the National Assembly outlawed slavery in Saint Saint Domingue in 1793. Now, going forward, though, who is going to come in and ruin everything? This is Toussaint after his successful independence movement. Here comes Napoleon, though, right? Because notice the years. Notice I said 1793, Haiti outlaws slavery, right? Or Saint-Domingue outlaws slavery. And they stay within the French Empire for a while. Well, in 1804, 1802, Napoleon comes into power. And in 1802, French troops land that were sent there by him. Because what Napoleon wants to do is he wants to reinstate slavery. All right. Napoleon wants to bring slavery back. This is one of his conservative hangups, right? One of the reasons why we don't like Napoleon as a person, because he's not liberal all the time. He's kind of conservative along this vein due to the fact that he's just like, oh, uh -huh, slavery. That's fine. Well, because remember, conservatives like to go backwards, not forwards and change. And so conservatives are also fans of like old forms of slavery. So in January 1802, French troops land there, sent by your boy, Napoleon. Now, the French accused Toussaint L'Ouverture of starting another uprising, saying that he was going to try and make them a completely new country and break them away from the French Empire altogether. So what they do is they orchestrate a booby trap, and they capture Toussaint L'Ouverture at a meeting um, in 1802 where he was supposed to come peacefully and actually discuss how Haiti was going to operate still without slavery. Well, that didn't go so well, and he gets captured, and he dies in the Alps in 1803. They ship him all the way to France, and he dies in one of the, like a man from one of the warmest climates in the world, dies in one of the coldest prisons in the world, right? It's very, very sad. But Toussaint L'Ouverture, when I say he died 10 months later, I'm talking about Toussaint, all right? Toussaint L'Ouverture. L'Ouverture is also a really, really cool name. He actually chose that name for himself, his last name, because it means the one who opens doors or the one who, one who opens paths, right? So I've always thought he was a really neat figure. He's also a heavily debated figure because a lot of people talk about how he basically brought slavery back on his own, right? Toussaint L'Ouverture did. Even though, like I said, he's going to be captured by Napoleon and they're going to send him to the Alps, the French Alps, and he's going to die there in prison in 1803. Well, when this occurs, these French troops are still there. So Toussaint's general and second in command, who also happens to be a terrible person, which we won't get into that right now, his name was Jean-Jacques Dessalines, right? That's Toussaint's general. And he takes over the another slave revolt, and in January 1st, 1804, Haiti is going to become an independent country under the leadership of Dessalines, right? Now, also later that year in 1804, Dessalines may or may not have had about in the neighborhood of 4,000 French people that were still stuck on the island massacred. Men, women, children, older people, it didn't matter. Now, this is, may or may not be true. We're not absolutely positive, but there is some pretty good documentation that points to the idea that Dessalines might have been very upset with the entire slavery institution, so much to the point that he had everyone that was left of French descent executed on the island. It's rough stuff. Uh, now, getting into it, though, he used guerrilla warfare to help him out to try and destroy the later French troops. But then also, these guys, the French troops, Napoleon wasn't there himself. They were actually under the command of this guy named Lacroix. And Lacroix and his armies are going to die from yellow fever particularly bad. Now, the... Blah, blah, blah. Haiti becomes the first black colony to free itself from European control, and it becomes the second, second colony ever to revolutionize itself from Europe, which is amazing. Um, it went the United States, and then Haiti was next. And he became the first emperor of Haiti when he was then later assassinated, because like I said, he wasn't the nicest guy ever, so a lot of people were going to revolt. And in 1820, Haiti becomes an independent republic with democratic elections. Now, to this day, Haiti is a great example. Go ahead and jot this down, a little star somewhere. Haiti is a great example of the terrible trends that popped up after these Latin American independence movements. Haiti is a, is a good example because following the liberation of these countries, they were rife with civil war and dispute, okay? So a lot of people were vying for control over these countries. They would uh, pick one leader, and then they say they didn't like them, and they would try to bring in another one. And then they would pick that leader, and then they would say they didn't like them, and they would try to bring in another one. So you're seeing a lot of issues with political dissension inside of these Latin American colonies, okay? So that's very, very important to understand. Got it? All right, but let's keep going forward, okay? So Jean-Jacques Dessalines creates Haiti. So that's your best early example 
of a Latin American independence movement, okay? So now we got to get into outside of the Caribbean, though, and now we're going to head down into the Spanish colonies. So we just talked about the French, now let's talk about the Spanish ones, right? Now, all this, again, directly caused by your boy, Napoleon. Now, do me a favor, go ahead and hit pause and put this triangle in your notes. Creoles goes here, Peninsulares goes here, Mulattoes, Mestizos go here, and Slaves and Natives go there, all right? Go ahead and hit pause, and I'll give you a hot second to kind of jot that down, okay? Now, welcome back, okay? Good stuff on you. Appreciate you doing that. Let's go ahead and define some of these people, though. So during the colonial period post-Columbus, right, post-1492, when the Spanish start colonizing Latin America, particularly Central and South America, they set up a social class system to keep control. Kind of like their own version of feudalism a little bit, right? Because you couldn't necessarily instate feudalism, you didn't have enough bodies or people. And also not to mention the fact that the encomienda system is going to end up killing so many natives that you had to establish some type of control or some type of government setup, right? So it looked like this. Now at the very, very top, the highest class you could be in the Latin American colonies was called a peninsulare, right? Now peninsulare means that you were born on the peninsula, right? Back in Iberia. You were normally associated with old school feudal wealth. You were usually an old school noble. And peninsulare means that you were born in Europe and you were the ruling class of the Latin American colonies. Now, Creoles, on the other hand, were born in Latin America. They were not necessarily of mixed race and they were actually descendant of the colonial workers that were sent there. Remember when we talked about Columbus? We talked about how Columbus might not have been as bad as the people that he brought with him, right? The people that he brought with him, the colonists themselves were the really bad ones. Well, all these colonists are not noble born. Like Columbus himself was one of the people that was sent by the royals, yes. But a lot of the people that he brought with him were just regular people looking for a job and looking to try and figure out an economical way to start a new life. The descendants of those people are known as Creoles, right? They're the descendants of the original colonists, most of them born in Latin America, and they were the ones that were going to start looking around at themselves, and they're going to be like, wait, why are we letting these Spanish people tell us what to do? We've been here for several hundred years. We should have our own country all by ourselves. Now, anyway, then we got to other classes below them. Mulattoes, mestizos, right? Now, remember, a lot of these Creoles, their earliest ancestors, were single men which led to a lot of racial mixing, okay? So the mulattoes, of course, as we remember from the European Exploration Unit, were African and European descendant people, and the mestizo was native and European descendant people. These are mixed cross races, right? And then at the very, very bottom, you had slaves and natives. Now, this was the early social class system that they had around 1500, but it's a great example of how colonialism is beginning to die. Colonialism is beginning to die because it's also just uncontrollable. With population growth on the rise and people living longer lives, you just can't control colonial growth taxation, monitoring of these people as it continues, you're just going to have to end up letting them go and letting them become their own countries. And this is what's called a pasta painting. And it was a big example of why it was becoming so hard to manage the colonies in Latin America, right? And the reason being is because this was a colon this was a family of a mestizo who had then married into a Creole. So what do you call that family? If a mestizo woman married a Creole man, are you now only one quarter mestizo? Where do they go in the social class system? What about if it's someone that was mestizo and native then mixed together and made themselves more native and less European? Where do they go in this whole system? What if a mestizo and a mulatto mixed together? Where do they go in this whole system? So it became very, 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 very uncontrollable. And the reason why it became even more uncontrollable was, of course, because your boy Napoleon invaded Spain in 1808, right? This is a part of his whole peninsular campaign, right? He took over Spain very, very swiftly and very easily, okay? However, he has to invade Spain in 1808 to try and then take back Portugal because they were violating his continental system, okay? This is part of his peninsular campaign. And when he removes the Spanish king... Hmm... And puts, of course, his brother Ferdinand the Seventh, or removes the Spanish king Ferdinand the Seventh, and makes his brother Joseph king of Spain, as he would tended to do, because this is one of his conservative traits, right? The Creoles use this as a reason 
to revolutionize, right? To lead an independence movement. And in 1810, rebellions all over Latin America started breaking out, right? And speaking of, like, this is a very, very heavily documented in another one of our romantic pieces. This is actually Francisco Goya's executions of May 3rd, 1808, when Napoleon started invading Spain, right? These are suspected guerrilla agents of the Peninsular Campaign being drug out of a village and shot by Napoleonic troops right here. So a very, very romantic piece, full of a lot of emotion, right? Now, peril in Spain is going to lead directly to these revolutions because the Napoleonic Wars in Spain led to a huge withdrawal of Spanish forces. So since all these Spanish troops are being pulled out and sent to Europe to fight off Napoleon, that means... Here's so messed up. Um, that mean There we go. That means that they have a little smaller number of people defending the colonies. So the Creoles use this as an opportunity to try and fight back, right? So in 1820, only 10,000 Spanish troops were left. There are a lot more Creoles than that. And the guy who wanted to lead these Creoles to their independence early on in northern South America, I know that sounds really ridiculous because it's northern South America, but I'm talking about the regions of Colombia, Ecuador, Venezuela, uh, Guyana, northern, well, not northern Brazil, because that's all Amazon rainforest, uh, Colombia, Panama, and I know some of you are like, Panama in Central America, calm down. Uh, but that whole area, this is their man, okay? His name is Simon Bolivar, right? Ha! Also, really, really quickly, extra credit opportunity. If one of y'all can tell me the intersection or street address where the Simone Bolivar statue is located in New Orleans, because there's a huge statue commemorating him in New Orleans, because there's also a lot of uh, American like founding father statues in Latin America, but there is a Simone Bolivar statue in New Orleans. If you can tell me the street address in the comments below, if you're the first person from E or the first person from G to do that, extra credit on that test that's coming up next Friday. All right, so now... Anyway, but he was also known as the Liberator because he was a Venezuelan-born Creole, right? He is Venezuelan, and he declares during all this melee, during all this hysteria while Napoleon's invading Spain, he declares Venezuela independent in 1811, okay? So in 1811, Bolivar's armies start preparing for battle. And they're very unsuccessful at first, right? They get driven all the way out of Venezuela, all the way over onto the other side of the Andes Mountains towards Peru, right? But in 1819, he acquired a huge army and he marched over the Andes into modern day Colombia and he defeated the Spanish army there, okay? So then in 1821, he declares Venezuela independent from Europe. And since this is still during the Napoleonic era, what did Napoleon do when he acquired the Louisiana ter Territory? He sold it. What did Napoleon do when he started doing all these other crazy things? He let it go, right? Now, after he gets exiled the second time in 1815, Spain is left very weak and unable to fight these liberation movements. So what they ended up having to do in 1821, Venezuela becomes independent because of the efforts of Simón Bolívar, right? And then what he decides to do is he marches north to Ecuador and he goes to meet another man by the name of Jose de San Martin. All right, so like now, Jose de San Martin is this guy. Notice I said Simón Bolívar led the independence movement inside of northern South America, the northern region. I'm going to throw a map up here too that you can definitely take a screenshot of so you can go ahead and look at that. But Jose de San Martin is a little bit different. He's a simple guy. He's very modest. He's born in Argentina, and he spent a lot of time in Spain as a military officer, so he's very formally trained, right? But he's a Creole all the same. He just happens to be a wealthy one. Now, Jose de San Martin decides that it's time to liberate the countries of Argentina, Chile, uh, Bolivia, or not Bolivia. Guess who actually liberates Bolivia? Bolivar liberates Bolivia. That's why it's named directly after him. Simone Bolivar, Bolivia. See? All right, now, anyway, this right here, that is a statue of Jose de San Martin, and I believe it's in Buenos Aires. All right, so now, getting into it, though, Argentina is going to declare itself independent in 1816, right after Bolivar's early losses in his military campaigns, right? San Martín, though, leads a huge army across the Andes into Chile and joins up with one of the most ridiculously sounding named people that you don't need to know the test, but I always put him in here because I think he's funny sounding, Bernardo O'Higgins. All right, so his mother, or his father was, no, his father was Irish and his mother was uh, Spanish, and they had him, and Bernardo O'Higgins was then the, prof, like, the product of said relationship. Now, what they're going to do together, though, they're going to free Argentina, 
and then they're going to free Chile. And then in 1822, they march towards Ecuador, and they meet up with Bolivar, and they decide how to remove the remaining Spanish forces from places like Lima, Peru, how they're going to get them out of Par Paraguay and Uruguay as well, right? So going forward, though, San Martin ends up leaving Latin America, and he dies in France in 1850. This says dies in battle, not true. Dies in France, in Paris in 1850, right? So San Martin was very successful liberating the southern regions of South America. I'm going to throw that map up here in about two seconds, okay? Bolivar is victorious at ridding most of Latin America of Spanish forces and establishing a new central Creole-run Latin American culture-based country at the very northern area. Now I'm going to get into that in a second, but let's look at that map really quick, okay? But there we go. So all these areas right here were established by Bolivar, okay? You see Ecuador, Colombia, Venezuela, uh, like this entire area, Panama, and the northern areas of Peru. San Martin, like, liberated this entire area in the south from Spanish forces. So Spain's now not involved in South America anymore, okay? So let me go ahead. There you go. So go ahead and take that screenshot right there, you know, there you go, that's, so Bolivar liberates the northern area, San Martin liberates the central and southern area, some of you are like, what about Brazil? I'm not talking about every single Latin American independence movement, I can't, I don't have enough time, but this right here is the country that Bolivar established, it was known as Gran Colombia, now Gran Colombia had inside of it the modern day countries of, let me make myself smaller, the modern day countries of Venezuela, Ecuador, Colombia, and Panama. There we go. Look how tiny I am. Now, anyway, so just a little squish. So short lived though, due to the fact of like I was saying, what happens when these Latin American countries liberate themselves? Huge amounts of civil war, huge amounts of charismatic leaders coming in and out, which was known as this thing called Cadilloism. All right, so a Cadillo. C-A-U-D-I-L-L-O? Cadillo? Yeah, I think that's how you spell it. A Cadillo is like a warlord in a sense. He runs a small faction of armies or people loyal to him, and he can control them and their movements and what they do. And some very famous Cadillos have existed throughout history. Uh, Jose de Santa Ana. Uh, some people have said that Bolivar and San Martin are Cadillos. Uh, some a lot of different ones. Um, there's a lot of other more present day ones that are super sketchy too. Like uh, um, some people could say, argue Che Guevara. Some people could argue Fidel Castro. Right? Cadilloism is going to be a big reason why this his liberated new Grand Colombia is just going to go, and it ends up dissolving because Bolivar resigns his leadership of like he was accused of being a dictator of Grand Colombia, and he ends up resigning his leadership under all these like to avoid going to war with all these Cadillos. And in 1830, Bolivar's Grand Colombia gets divided up into Colombia, Ecuador, Venezuela, and Panama later splits from Colombia later on with U.S. assistance in 1903, right? Well, the reason this is just a good example of the instability of these like liberation movements, right? And because of that instability, it's kind of a lot of the reasons why Latin America today still struggles economically, all right? So now getting into it, though, there's a bunch of other liberation movements. There's two particularly big ones that I'm not going to talk about because we just don't have time. Mexico and Brazil also then later liberate themselves as well, getting rid of all Spanish forces in the Western Hemisphere. And in U.S. history, you'll talk about this when you talk about the rise of Theodore Roosevelt and how he wanted Spain to just go away and stay over there. And one of the biggest examples of us finally banishing Spanish influence out was known as the Spanish-American War. All right. So there you go. Boom. That is the Latin American independence movement. Go ahead and jot all that stuff down. I'll talk to you guys later. Y'all have a good one. Go bang out that Albert I.O. assignment. I know it's hard, but you're going to be okay. I'll talk to you guys later. All right. Y'all have a good one.